Just a quick note before we start. This entire first season of Inspired Business was recorded before the coronavirus outbreak in the UK. Hence, there being no mention of it in the interviews. Thanks. Enjoy the podcast. Hello, and welcome to Inspired Business, the business podcast from the University of Derby. During this series, we are bringing you inspiring stories from across the business landscape in Derby, Derbyshire and beyond. We discuss the issues affecting your business and provide key insights from our guests for you to take away. I'm Toby Bradford, your host for the series. I'm joined by my co-host, business expert, Angela Tooley, who will offer you valuable analysis on the topics we cover. This week, we are joined by Nicole Yeomans, who is a green infrastructure and biodiversity specialist. She's also a graduate of the University of Derby. I'm joined by uh, our business expert, Angela Tooley. Angela, the, the world is being ever more focused on the environment and what we are doing to it and how we can improve it. Um, it's interesting that we are talking to uh, Nicole this week. Yes, it is. Nicole's job title just completely blows my mind because it just reminds me what a fast paced world we are in. I don't know about you, but I've never met anyone before in that sort of role. And actually, it's fascinating when you start to listen to what she does, the sorts of things that she's talking about in terms of improving, not just fixing what damage, you know, has been done by construction or infrastructure work or things like that, but improving and making a positive net change on the diversity, the biodiversity of that area. It just shows what a step change we've we've made within the UK in terms of the importance of the environment. That's that whole idea, isn't it? It's, it's, we, it's not that, right, we no longer want to make stuff worse. We actually want to make it better as we're going along. And it, and it really is a, changing the way we're thinking. It's a real challenge. And I think it's, it's something that not just locally, but at government, everyone's trying to get their heads around. And you can see that in some of the conversations and debates that are happening around some of the big infrastructure projects that are planned in the UK, like HS2, is is that how do you design something that is future fit, not just in terms of meeting the requirements of a changing population and the needs of that changing population, but also ensuring that you do it in a way that you retain something for the future generation and actually recognition that what we are doing to the environment is rapidly starting to impact the way we live, we eat, we work. Absolutely. Now, of course, it's not just about uh, Nicole's job, this podcast. We talk about her background and that story is worth a listen to just on its own. It's almost... Well, she is writing a book, in fact, about it. This is what I love about listening to these podcast interviews is that we're we're having people from so many different backgrounds who have so many different stories to tell. And I don't think any of them, I think if they reflected and look back on their five, ten year old self, would ever imagine the journey that they've gone on. And I just think these podcast series has been, you know, we developed this series to inspire people in business, but actually there's some fantastic stories in terms of careers and development of young people. And I think I'll certainly be getting my children to listen to some of these interviews because actually I think what people need nowadays is good role models. And I think we don't have enough people who are, who are, are role models who inspire the future generation. It's seeing where people have come from and where they've got to in that journey. It shows what's possible. I think it's fantastic. Okay, well, Angela, we'll be back later for our analysis of the interview with Nicole. But for now, let's hear what Nicole has to say. 
Hello and welcome to Nicole Yeomans. Very excited about this. Nicole, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. So um, as you're already here, I'm Nicole Yeomans. I am a green infrastructure and biodiversity specialist and I'm actually a former student from the University of Derby. Go Nicole. (laughs) Thank you. So what did you study when you were here? I studied zoology. And I I thoroughly enjoyed it and I would definitely recommend it to anybody else out there. So who were your favourite lecturers? Oh, am I allowed to say that? You can say whatever you like. Um, Well, I've had, I thought they were all brilliant, but I had lots of support and inspiration from people like Michael Sweet, Mark Bulling, Andrew Ramsey. Great stuff. Nell Beaumont, they were all very supportive and very inspiring people. Good. I find them very inspiring too. You're a green infrastructure and biodiversity specialist. Who do you work for? I work for ACOM or AECOM, depending on which side of the pond you Oh, that's what it is. It, it, it depends <laughs> because it's quite a big company, isn't it? So yes, what, is a, what is AECOM or AECOM? What does it do? Well, it stands for, and I have to always check this, Architecture, Engineering, Consulting, Operations and Maintenance. So in kind of one swoop, you get an idea of exactly what it is that the company does. That's it everything, is, isn't it? Everything. Surely? It's a global company. Um, it has nearly 90,000 employees. It, it works in over 150 countries worldwide. I believe it began as an oil refinery back in the 60s and then it moved into buildings and construction. Right. And kind of evolved into the ACOM that, that we know today. So it's a global company, but in the UK and Ireland, it has three markets which it focuses on, and that is civil infrastructure, buildings and places, and environment and ground engineering. Was that that where you you? That's where in? I sit. Yeah, ground engineering it covers a range of disciplines. These can vary anywhere from the water environment, archaeology, landscape architecture, acoustics, and ecology and um, ecology is the discipline that my team sits within um, recently we actually won the award for um, large consultancy of the year from the chartered institute of environment and ecological management in the uk for ecology so we, we work with a wide range of clients and yes they quite often within our team we work with highways england network rail for large infrastructure projects right okay i'm part of the green infrastructure team so we're a new and growing team within ecology which is it's always nice to um, be at the kind of the forefront of um, new and exciting roles so we basically look at providing nature-based solutions that work across disciplines so when you say nature-based solution using nature to help solve the problem I don't know how that would work yeah so basically that might be for example creating a green bridge where you could have you could have your normal box standard concrete bridge but instead you look at it at an opportunity to potentially connect two habitats so you would green the bridge which would be adding in shrubs potentially trees. Um, On a bridge? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, they're quite impressive. Building up embankments where you can have wildflower meadows, so that would support pollinators. You you can go into more detailed design features like bat boxes and mammal crossings. So green infrastructure. We want to provide sustainable solutions not only for wildlife but also people and communities as well so it goes across we work across disciplines and across sectors to try and deliver something that improves biodiversity and well-being. How long has this been a focus of of AECOM because you've got quite a decent team of ecologists now haven't you? Yeah I believe we've got over 100 maybe even 150 ecologists in the UK. Just in the UK there's a Yeah in the UK yeah and in the Midlands is actually the biggest team of ecologists. Yeah, we we like I say we are we're a new team. There's only about eight or so of us in the green infrastructure team at the moment, but um, we are within the UK. There are lots of people working on green infrastructure, ecosystem services, natural capital, policy and appraisal that all kind of support one another, and we work on similar projects. So describe how your team works what is it you're looking at when when a when a project comes to you how do you approach that well something that we work on 
quite frequently is biodiversity net gain assessments. So biodiversity net gain means it's basically a development that leaves the environment in a better state than it did before. Oh, rather than just trying not to make it worse, you actually yeah, try to make it better. Yeah, you're looking to make it better. Huh. Despite well-established nature protection laws that we've had in the UK for quite some time now, our biodiversity is continuing to decline at an alarming rate, quite frankly. So if our biodiversity continues to decline as it is, the value of the natural environment, which is so important to things like well-being, our economy, and flood mitigation, clean water, crop pollination. Flood mitigation, yeah, we know. that. Yeah, we know about that recently. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, we've seen that recently. And climate regulation. So we all depend very much on biodiversity. Things like land use change and development that can have a negative impact on biodiversity. So by incorporating a principle of net gain, biodiversity net gain, new development can actually enhance the natural environment and deliver long lasting improvements for biodiversity and people. What that actually means in practice is that something that's fundamental is that you would first off apply what's called the mitigation hierarchy to a development where you would avoid making significant impacts to the environment you would minimize those significant effects and in terms of net gain you would look to restore or enhance what you have on site and then if that you could do restoration and enhancement and if that wasn't enough based on a biodiversity net gain assessment you might have to offset on third party land oh right okay some of the losses of the development. So I can understand I can understand restoring something. If there's something there, there's a, a wood there and you want to make that mm-hmm. more sustainable. Yeah. But the new things, things like the Green Bridge, I assume that's... What other sort of things would you be able to put in? Well, the Green Bridge is a bit of... That's kind of separate to biodiversity net gain. Cause it, well, I, I suppose at the moment, there are ways of incorporating things like Green Bridges into a net gain assessment. But the, the easiest way of looking at it is if, say, for example, you... You have a woodland, you've got a hectare of of woodland on your site and you want to take 50% of that woodland away, you're going to have to put back generally a 10% increase. So you'd have to put 60% woodland back somewhere. So describe to me how an offset would work. You're doing some work somewhere and you need to make a net gain, but you can't do it on that site necessarily. So how would that work? Um, You would look to get a third party landowner agreement and you would use your biodiversity impact assessment. The first steps would be to look at how many biodiversity units they're called. It's a way of measuring biodiversity losses. So, so that is that species or No, we use habitats as a measure right, okay. of losses. So basically you would map out all of the habitats that are on the site. That's what you would use satellite imagery, GIS mapping, you'd also use an ecological survey called a phase 1 survey that where an ecologist has actually gone out on site and mapped out the various habitats and made any notes on what species are present and that's kind of the first survey before they would go back and do detailed protected species surveys but um, for our assessment we need the phase one mapping so then we would then convert that into a map that would give us areas quite specific areas that go down to kind of like five decimal places of each habitat type and then we have various biodiversity calculators which are amazing tools which will measure out um, the losses and the gains so when we put in our initial habitat types we get a list of the habitats on on that site could be deciduous woodland species rich grassland it could be bare ground you know all the habitats that are there and then we would provide a condition for those habitats which is given to us from an ecologist that's actually been out on site most of the time and these habitats have already been assigned a distinctiveness which helps to give them their score so like a woodland would have high distinctiveness compared to amenity grassland which is like the grassland that you walk past when you walk into the university you know so yeah so we would get a value of what the pre-habitats were on site and then we would look at what's being lost what's being retained and within what's being retained can we enhance any of that and that's how we would get our final figure and in the post 
development calculations you look at things like time to target condition as well difficulty in creating that habitat there are new ways of calculating the losses and gains through um defra have released their own they they've released a new calculator which looks at habitat connectivity and strategic value so if it's within a strategic location like it's in a local authority plan for example if they've got priority to um, enhance this habitat type and that all influences the calculation that you get at the end one of the ways that we like to work as well is that we get involved in each phase of the design process so if you have a biodiversity net gain assessment as an iterative thing rather than it gets done at the end of a development you can meaningfully influence the design and and try and help so rather than saying right i've done all this massive plan this is what i want have a look to see how it will affect the environment you go right we're going to start on this site what can we do here so exactly. you're right in the beginning, you're in there. Yeah, that's how we'd like to work because obviously when you, like you say, if you come in right at the end, then your the score is the score and we can't change that, unfortunately. <laughs> so that, that's when you, you would look to offset. So what I'd like to skip to now mm-hmm. is kind of questions that I'm, I'm very interested in. Mm-hmm. How did you get to where you are now working for this company? Where, where have you come from? We know you've done a zoology degree at Derby, but... What's your history? I've got a very diverse history. <laughs> I am the daughter of a reptile expert. So he, my dad used to actually have Europe's first ever reptile farm in the 1990s. So in, in, in Nottingham, in Nottingham, which is obviously an interesting place for mm-hmm. us to have a herpetological expert and a reptile farm. So yeah, as a, as a child, I grew up on a farm which had rooms and rooms and rooms full of leopard geckos, chameleons, corn snakes. It was just amazing, absolutely amazing place to grow up. And then we also ended up diversifying into farming crickets and locusts, which is also bizarre. So I kind of was a sponge to all of my dad's interests. I grew up loving animals. I was very... um, But not just cows and sheep and dogs and cats. um. Yeah, (laughs) venomous snakes, you know, alligators, cobras you name it, black mambas, we we had it all. So yeah, I was inspired by my dad growing up and had a love of animals. My dad was um, very influential on my um, interests and my personality. And yeah, so I, I'm actually writing a book about him. The book is called King Cobras in the Living Room. And because you had king cobras in your living room. Yes. and it, In Nottingham. In Nottingham, yes. And it's it's a, basically a memoir about my dad's life. Um, so he was a king cobra expert who ended up devoting his career to trying to help protect king cobras, which unfortunately had a tragic ending. So he was actually bitten by one of his king cobras and he, and he passed away. So it's kind of... Oh, heavens. Yeah, so it's kind of a book about my dad's life, my life before I was born and what inspires a man to dedicate his life to reptiles. How does a man from Derby in the 1960s become a world-renowned King Cobra expert and all of the crazy things that happen in between that? Like, I like to call him a cross between Steve Irwin and Johnny Rotten. So <laughs> that was the kind of personality that he was. Okay. So there's, uh, it's hopefully a, an amusing and inspiring story of my life with my dad. And he certainly inspired you. He did, yeah, he did. So yeah, I'm just um, working on that at the moment. That's what I do in my spare time. I didn't go to university as a, as a teenager. I moved to Spain instead. And when I moved to Spain, I worked with the head of reptiles at, in the south of Spain at Fuencarola Zoo, which right, okay. um, is a fantastic zoo where they were one of the first people to breed the false water gharial which is an amazing crocodilian that's from malaysia which is very very rare but yeah so while i was working at the zoo there um i got opportunities to do things like help train komodo dragons um, train them to do what <laughs> well they like they wanted to be able to move the komodo dragon safely so this amazing creature called rayo i believe was about four foot even when he was a young 
juvenile and his his tail was about I'm, two I'm just foot. picturing that in this room that's quite yeah. on the table that's quite, quite a big thing quite some size um yeah so they they wanted a way to be able to train him almost like a dog so we used to go in to cage and we'd train him to tap his nose on a red ball that was on the end of a, a, of a long stick so once he tapped his nose on the red ball we'd give him a mouse which was what he ate a defrosted frozen mouse so eventually he would become trained that if he followed the red ball wherever we needed him to be so from one side of the cage to the other so we could safely contain him for whatever reason if we needed a vet to come out for example which we did once I actually had to go and help with him having an ultrasound because he had digestive issues well that that's that was another (laughs) day at the zoo so yeah and whilst I was in Spain, I realised that I was so passionate about zoology and I hadn't been to university and that I really wanted to, to come back to England and go to university and become a qualified zoologist. So what inspired you? What, what, what was the decision that you took? How did you come to that decision to go to university? Just because I was working in Spain at the time and I realised that um, I wanted to take zoology seriously and I wanted to do it as a profession and I'd actually been inspired my dad always inspired me and he had some amazingly interesting friends and I one of them came to stay and he was an amazing zoologist that had lived in the jungles of Cameroon he'd lived there for 14 years and he'd done research for National Geographic what was his name Chris Wilde perfect name as well for a zoologist and yeah, so my dad wasn't a zoologist, but he had, he didn't go to university. He, well, he was, was a, self- a zoologist, obviously. He was, yeah, but he was a self-taught person. He never w- got a degree, so that was never something that was necessarily in the forefront of my mind, that I needed to get a degree to be passionate about animals and work in zoology. But then I met Chris, and I was like, this guy is amazing. He's so inspiring, all his tales. Looking for gaboon vipers that have the longest fangs in the snake kingdom, researching giant frogs, all these incredible tales. Um, And he definitely influenced my decision to be a zoologist and to get a degree and to come back to England and take academia seriously. So because I didn't follow a traditional path, I had to kind of do extra exams and it took a bit longer than I would have liked. But then that's when I ended up at the University of Derby. And then when I got here, then my world was completely blown open because I suddenly started to find interest in bacteria and (laughs) did a complete U-turn and went from loving, which I I still love them, but um, I was very much interested in um, microbes and genetics once I got to university. Went from enormous lizards to things that you just can't see at all yeah that's yeah and and also the marine environment I've also I've always loved marine biology so that's how I ended up getting to know Michael Sweet so um who is a marine specialist who does a lot of work with corals and things like that yeah. yeah he's a coral reef expert and a molecular ecologist and he's a very interesting man and yeah so whilst at university I went to the Maldives to research coral reefs out there on one of Michael Sweet's research trips which you know you had to twist my arm to get me to go to the Maldives oh, it's such a such a dear. hard life in the Indian Ocean it's just fascinating especially the research on coral reefs you know they're such a, an incredible habitat and they're, they're decreasing at an alarming rate and yeah I was always passionate about the marine world as well so it was just a great experience to come to university and, and you don't know where that experience can take you I, I've met some amazing people as well some of my friends um, that I went to university with they've gone on to have fantastic careers working for the, the Sanga Institute for Genetics and all sorts of amazing things so it was just a brilliant experience and I would highly recommend it. <laughs> when I finished university I was looking for a marine based role and I was lucky enough to be accepted into a position as a marine planner working for the, the marine management organisation. A marine planner, what does a marine planner do? Well my role consisted of policy development for the South Marine Plan. So the UK was split up into uh, marine plan areas. So I was lucky enough to be based in Poole in Dorset and worked on the South 
Coast Marine Plan, which was a complex area because it had one of the busiest shipping channels in the world. Uh, well, first off, it went from the River Dart in Devon all the way to Folkestone, and it covered an area of 20,000 square kilometres. So it was a huge area with, like I say, the, one of the busiest shipping canals channels it had 60 marine protected areas as well as military activity on the coast and a UNESCO World Heritage Site so it was a very complicated area to provide policies which you know meet social economic and environmental. So you're having to work out a plan for all this area is that just the water or, or how it affects the communities? And Well, um, it's it goes from all the way up the tidal extent of rivers. So anywhere that's influenced by the sea. So the tidal extent of rivers all the way out to the exclusive economic zone, which is where we border um, in the South Marine Plan, France, Jersey. So they, they, they span huge areas. And obviously it's very complex um, and there's a lot of different needs. So we had policies, social policies on fishing. We had environmental policies on marine protected areas. There were policies on oil and gas extraction and aggregate extraction, which is like the sand and stones which we use to build. So obviously they even aggregate policies have influence across the whole of the UK construction industry. Which is kind of... You're going from bacteria to many more things. You're not just looking at the marine life. That's what I really enjoyed about that role, actually, was um, having having a, a wider perspective on things. Because I think sometimes you can you can get blinkers on and just focus on 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 one single thing. And that's also brilliant to be a specialist. But it was nice to go back and look at the whole of the marine area and all the different people and disciplines. And so you're going from your tiny little blinkers looking at microbes to to uh a massive expansive thing which takes you back to AECOM I suppose which yeah is- yeah it's a, another a large company yeah. that um spans spans the, the globe covers a wide range of um disciplines so yeah so how how important do you think it is that people like you exist within large companies like AECOM I think now that the, there's a complete paradigm shift that large companies wouldn't be without people that work in the environment sector because I think it it adds so much value and it's so important in terms of risk and resilience and future proofing and that's kind of the world that we that we live in now we can't just push environmental sustainability under the carpet and I think any big company understands that and that's why we have companies like Acom creating new and exciting roles like for example in our team alone we have things like digital visualization where we use 3d imagery vr to inspire our clients and and let them see kind of what things like the green bridge for example Mm -hmm. like what does that look like in the landscape what are the benefits it will provide and, and, and inspire people in a way that that was never done before and we also have things like ecological modeling so we've got an ecological modeler in our team now who is like a data wizard, I like to call him. Um, so that's modeling and programming. Um, yeah, so yeah. that we're kind of, Acom especially, I think are a really innovative company and they always drive forward new and exciting areas that can strengthen the company's resilience, that can inspire people. Because when a workforce is inspired as well, everyone wants to feel like they're making a, a positive contribution. So how important is it that business takes the environment seriously? I think it's fundamental that business takes the environment seriously. I know that ACOM look at delivering innovative, pragmatic and resilient sustainable development solutions. The world is reaching for solutions that challenge issues like how are we going to feed and house a population of 10 billion people with all their needs for energy, land, water, climate challenges. So ACOM weave in development solutions into the daily activities of our clients so we look to assist them in making better decisions on investment um, corporate strategies supply chain and procurement and and we also work in partnership with some leading academic institutions which help enhance our research and development capabilities cool so acom is clearly doing quite a lot Mm. but what about other businesses is business doing enough 
as far as the environment's concerned, as far as sustainability is concerned? I think there's always room for improvement. I think there has been a shift in the way that businesses think. So previously it was always a win-win situation, whereas now businesses look to their long-term influence there's there's been a shift definitely in the way that businesses operate um now that there's a drive towards being more sustainable it not only does it draw in potentially more clients because people want to work with companies that um, are sustainable that have got a good reputation that are resilient to things like climate change and biodiversity losses but then it also inspires inspires employees for example i actually read a study recently at where UCLA found that employees of companies that adopt sustainable practices are 16% more productive, apparently. 16%. 16%. So if that's not a reason to be sustainable, then I don't know why not. Improve that productivity and get more out of your employees. Value for money. Well, if people are happy to work in a place and, and if people have their own environmental thoughts, then that's going to help. So it's your job. You're actually It's actually your job to make the place better than it was when you found it, which is, sounds to me, a great thing to be able to achieve. So should we be taking more individual responsibility as far as the environment's concerned? I do think that we can all all make a difference and and do our bit, but I think fundamentally it should be a top-down approach and that there should be key policy changes. So at the minute in Biodiversity Net Gain, there's been a lot of momentum around and a lot of support with various policy documents. So we've had um, the, the Lawton Review, the White Paper for natural environment, the natural capital committee, the 25 year environment plan and the the soon to hopefully be appointed environment bill which will make a 10% net gain mandatory for all development under the town and country planning act. So things are moving in in the right direction and that's that's really because of key policy changes you know we're we're given a clear and plus we're having big players like highways england and network rail and the berkeley group all opting in to achieve a no net loss and a no net or a net gain before it is a mandatory requirement they're basically giving the message to all their supply chain that you know this is it this is the way forward now this is how more important than just just complying with the law it's important because it's important yeah 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 Yeah. exactly now i'm so impressed by what you do um thank you it's it's something that that a lot of people feel is very important and the fact that you're able to do that on a daily basis to try and make the world a better place for all the creatures that live in it but what do you consider has been your greatest achievement what's given you the most satisfaction well it was recently actually it was when i was invited to join the university of derby's board of environmental sciences advisors yes so that was that i I felt very honored so what 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 does that involve from your point of view um that involves just feeding in to ways in which the environmental sciences department shape some of their courses so you're influencing what we teach to our students you're working with our academics yeah exactly in a way yes cool do you come in and do guest lectures and talks uh, to that's the something that we're, that we're currently working on yeah we, we're planning on, on doing that and we're coming to the wildlife conservation lectures hopefully and talking a little bit about wild biodiversity net gain green infrastructure yeah so all that is to come hopefully next year i believe now we're, we're coming towards the end of our podcast and i'm going to ask you a question that we ask all our podcastees What's the single most important piece of business advice you can give to our podcast listeners? I think it is to always be yourself, be professional, but be yourself. Let your personality come through. Nobody likes a corporate robot. People do business with other people. So let your, let your story, let your personality, let your strengths show because that is you know that's how we get the the best out of people and that's how you end up with a vibrant dynamic team which is fundamental to business thank you nicole yeomans thank you thanks for having me I'm joined again by business expert Angela Tooley. Well, Angela, how fast is the world changing? Very fast indeed. It's really interesting, isn't it, when you when you listen to interviews like Nicole's, it kind of smacks you in the face and makes you realise that. And every day's a learning day. And I think this 
this interview reminded me of that is that I've compared with other interviews that we've done together. I found this quite a, a challenging interview to listen and analyse to simply because Nicole's talking about concepts and terminology that is completely alien to me. So, you know, things like net gains and, and nature-based solutions are just phrases that I'd never heard of before the interview. So. Well, the, ho- the whole job role is is completely new. It's it's the whole idea of creating these these roles that will look at the environment and how these companies are going to affect the environment from the outset. Exactly. And this is happening in so many other sectors. And I think one of the challenges that we have as educators, as parents, as responsible employees or employers in the local business community is how do we support these young people? So how do we help develop skills in our young people that allow them to be curious and be creative and and build resilience so they can cope with an ever-changing world, uh, recognising the increasing pressures in terms of well-being in the workplace and things like that? Because these skills, in some respects, are more important than the hard technical skills that we provide them because they are ever-changing. And you think about some of the new technical roles that are coming out, like data scientists, you have to be refreshing that skill base every couple of years to just to make sure that you are still current. Because in five, ten years, there will be new roles that we haven't even thought of might exist yet. Exactly. And, and, and Nicole's is certainly one of them. And I don't think Nicole when she started, I think it was a zoology degree, Mm -hmm. ever really contemplated where she would end up. And and by the sounds of it, she, it's a fascinating and interesting career that she's, that she's fell into. I think she was always going to end up in some sort of conservation, sustainable sort of animal plant based career given her background and making a netflix film about life obviously exactly but it's it's been a massive cultural shift hasn't it everything is is changing so fast everything is moving towards a different view you you look at the way that governments are now having a much keener eye on the environment yeah yes it is and it's interesting that that we you know we've recently heard about about what china are doing i mean china are the biggest polluter uh, in the world. And and there's always been this thing around people say, well, why should we keep doing stuff and look at, you know, trying to be more sustainable in our own business and our own local community when China as a biggest polluter is doing nothing. Even that's now changing. So recent announcements from China about single-use plastic being phased out from the end of 2020 is a massive step forward. And that's because I'm sure it's become because of pressure from other governments, from their own people, and actually just seeing the effect that that is starting to have. That is the thing. It's personal pressure, pressure from the population, pressure from the consumer, pressure from the workforce. I mean, the interesting statistic that uh, Nicole brought out that companies that have a sustainable policy, their employees feel 16% more productive. Undoubtedly, there are lots of what I would call soft benefits to a organisation or a, a business community being more pro-environmental, trying to be more sustainable. The problem that we've got at the moment is that because it's still in very early stages of evolution, there's not a lot of data around research is limited. So actually, you know, we're starting to see some statistics in terms of the amount of companies who are now increasing the amount of um, sustainable products that they produce. It's the biggest growing sector. So that low carbon consumer goods sector is the biggest growing sector and has been since 2008. There's statistics around that show, and Nicole's spoken about productivity, but there's statistics around that show that the highest performing businesses are ones that have some sort of sustainability agenda that they work to. It can certainly help you win new business. Uh, and, the, and one of the positive things that that is being done is that in most now of the public tenders, there's an increasingly large amount of score 
that it is assigned to you demonstrating your responsible business practices. So actually, when you are bidding for a piece of work for a, a perhaps a local council contract or something like that, you have to demonstrate not only what your policies and procedures are, but also what you are doing, what you are actively doing. And so those sorts of things are starting to encourage people to do more. Be- because it is starting to affect the bottom line. It is starting to affect the bottom line. Yes. I mean, sadly, unfortunately, in many businesses, that rate of return on investment is still absolutely key. And we still see that at government as well, is that it's all well and good doing all these things. But ultimately, if it's not going to make a, a net positive impact on my bottom line, it's still a very difficult business case for many businesses to get over the line with their shareholders and their investors. I think it will change. I think one of the challenges is, and we we touched on culture earlier, culture takes time. So a change in culture and that sort of transformation is a long-term process. And we've spoke about this on previous podcasts, but actually, particularly around low carbon and sustainability, things are happening so fast. People are struggling to get their heads around it and mindset changes are really important. Because the the, the general population, the consumer mindset is, is changing almost daily. You know, from one day you suddenly find some new information and now I'm going to be completely green. I'm going Going, going vegan, I want to buy an electric car. And that is a sudden change of mindset. And maybe the business community is not ready for that. They haven't seen it coming. Yeah, I think that's the case. And I think there's also this wariness as well, is that is this just another trend that will disappear again? So you look at sort of other significant changes that happen and some things stick around. If you think about the music industry, you know, the amount of new things. We had Betamax that disappeared. We had mini discs that disappeared. And, and I think people are like, well, actually, is it worth me investing in this? Is, is this going to be a long term thing? Or is this just going to be another fad that people are just deciding they're going to be vegan for 2020 and actually they'll go back to eating meat again later? So I think I think that there needs a, a bit of time as well for things to level out and, and people to start seeing what those trends are going to be and what which are those elements that are going to stick around for longer and that are going to be long term things that actually we do need to make some sort of change around. I think the other interesting thing from Nicole's interview and and one of the things that she highlighted it is the link between biodiversity and nature and well-being and this is important and this is something that as employers we do need to take responsibility for. Increasingly we are seeing businesses being impacted by loss of time, loss of productivity through people being off through stress, through illnesses that are related to being stretched to uh, pressures that they're seeing at work or in their private lives and things like that. And actually, I think Nicole's absolutely right. We all know how good it feels when you go for a walk in the woods or by the river or by the sea. So, you know, you come back and you feel fresh. So actually, there's some validity to what she's saying there. So maybe something that companies perhaps could do as a starting point is think about, well, actually, let's not think about how I can relate being a more sustainable business to my bottom line. Let's perhaps think about how I can think about it in terms of supporting my people and supporting the development of well-being in the workplace. And that is something that we all need to be responsible for. So, you know, perhaps if people think about it that way as a step one, then it doesn't matter what the bottom line says, because actually that could just be something as simple as a team or as an organisation going out and doing a community project together or as a team having a day a week where you go for a team walk, for example. My team in the summer, bizarrely, uh, sometimes get the tennis rackets out and play tennis in the car park for 20 minutes and laugh at each other and run around. But actually, I think that's really important for their time together and, and the stresses that they have for the other seven hours in the day. So I think, you know, let's think about things in in different ways and not just keep reflecting on, focusing on just one thing, which is ultimately the bottom line. Nicole's final piece of advice was to be yourself, to 
people to businesses. Do you find in business that people don't act as themselves? They they put on a persona? It's increasingly changing, actually. I think the new generation, we talk about Generation Z and millennials, I think they're a very different workforce. And I think their expectations in terms of what they expect from a career is certainly very different from mine and your days when we were starting out. And I think it's not just about salary that's an attractant to businesses. I think they look for a business that has similar values to what they have. They want to fit. They want things like a, the right work-life balance. So I think this is something that businesses really need to start getting their heads around. How do I make myself attractive to a future workforce? How do I make myself attractive to encourage people with the skills that I need? Because I think businesses don't always look in the right places sometimes for their future workforce. So what characteristics do you think businesses should be looking for when they're looking for new people? I think they need to be focusing more on the soft skills, identifying potential employees who have that thirst for knowledge and learning and creativity and are agile because they're the skills that a business who is going to grow and succeed in an ever-changing world is going to have to have. Because the world is becoming so flexible in a sense that you know you need to have the people who can move with it and sway with it and bend with it you can almost teach someone with those sorts of soft skills the basics of any role but they're the skills that you can't necessarily teach them quickly or from a manual or a textbook well thank you angela and um I'd like to thank Nicole Yeomans again for bringing some new ideas to this podcast. And I'd like to thank Angela Tooley, our business expert, who has helped us uh, explore some of those. Thanks, Angela. Thank you. Next time, we'll be joined by Dean Jackson, the boss of Derby wetsuit specialist, Hoob. You've been listening to Inspired Business, a podcast from the University of Derby telling amazing and inspirational stories from businesses in Derby, Derbyshire and beyond. Please subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a rating or review and tell a friend who might also like to listen. Also, if you'd like to be a guest on a future episode of the show, please get in touch. You can find contact details and more information about the series at derby.ac.uk forward slash inspired business. Thanks so much for listening. We'll catch up with you again very soon.